Hi, I'm Melanie from UWorld. We're looking at next-gen practice questions from the UWorld question banks. Alrighty, so looking at an actual NGN style case study from UWorld here, what I want to start talking about first is the clinical judgment measurement model. It serves as the foundation for all of this NGN new style content. So here we have, this is kind of a mock-up to make it easy to understand what this means, but to really understand it in depth, there's a link over here you can go to, to the NCSBN website, and they are the ones who created the clinical judgment measurement model from the NCSBN. So here we kind of have a little on the green and blue side on the left, um, you can see that this is what, and we want to focus on the word measurement here. So they created this to help measure nursing students' clinical judgment. And so that's the basis for the NGN content. Now, if you look over on the right side, you can see that it kind of like follows the nursing process in a way, but the nursing process, of course, is focused on like, what do we do as nurses when we're taking care of patients? Whereas the clinical judgment measurement model is testing how well you can move through these steps in making decisions at the bedside. So starting at the top, um, recognizing cues just means like, can you notice the stuff that you need to notice to make decisions? Analyzing cues means that like, can you take those pieces and pick out what's important and put it together? Prioritizing hypotheses is taking that information, putting it together, and then deciding what's most important here. Generating solutions is then, what can I do about this? Taking action is, let's do it now, how do I do it? And then evaluating outcomes is, did it work? Should I do something different? And then we kind of just continue in this continuous cycle, just like the nursing process. It goes as a, just a continual loop of like taking care of your patient is like checking things out, intervening, did that work over and over again. So it kind of mimics that, but the purpose is different. This is for testing, understanding of clinical judgment. So with that in mind, when we look at a case study itself, the idea is that each question in the case study is going to try to hit one of these steps so they can measure how are you doing as a student matching up with each of these steps of the clinical judgment measurement model. Are you hitting each of these? Which is why you can see here that this is a six-step model and there are six questions in a case study. So let me flip over. So the nurse's notes tab here gives us some good information to start with. We can tell they're in the emergency department. It tells us that it's 8 a.m., 800 hours. That may or may not be important. The, and then we can see here the client has come in due to fear of having a heart attack. Heart attacks, of course, are, you know, one of the most emergency conditions you can walk in with. The client states, I was taking a bus from home. We'll just kind of read it over briefly here. Um, chest tightness. They had some help. And there's some fear here of what happens next time if they can't find help. And then they're saying that they have had some similar experiences recently it's kind of random, and they're afraid of what's going to happen if it happens again and if they'll have help. So then looking over, of course, we have a lot of clinical data here. So we're going to go from the nurse's notes tab and make sure we're looking at all the information. Here's the history and physical tab. This has a lot of helpful information in it. So these are typically written by your healthcare provider here. And this is going to tell us a lot about their physical symptoms. So generally, we can see that this client, even though we're not looking at them, we can tell from the notes that they are well-groomed, taking care of themselves, but having some minimal eye contact and appearing fidgety, tearful, a flat affect, which is something that can be associated with depression, um, some other conditions. So definitely some, maybe some mental health issues here we want to be sensitive to. The client is trembling. Uh, the thought process is logical. That's helpful to know. Um, and no reports of suicidal or homicidal ideations. That's great. Definitely something we want to always screen for with um, mental health concerns. Cardiovascular is important here because they're reporting chest tightness. Um, we've got random episodes of chest pain, some dizziness, which could be, you know, concern for perfusion if they're be being dizzy. Um, shortness of breath, heart palpitations that have been um, happening and stopping over a few months. Uh, spontaneous resolution of pain. Um, they're having some weight loss, which there's a bunch of different reasons you could have that. Um, thyroid issues or just depression or um, other mental health stuff. And then we see here they drink alcohol socially. So that's not something that's jumping out to us. The client reports having a glass of wine with the evening meal yesterday. So none of that's really jumping out for psychosocial there. 
Um, and then just making sure we don't miss anything, here's the vital signs tab. So this patient right now, same time, we can see it's also still 8 a.m. here with this note. Um, temperature's 99, eh, a little bit elevated, but I wouldn't say they're febrile right now. Um, getting close to tachycardic here, um, but she could be due to anxiety. Respiratory status is totally fine, 18, 98 on room air, that's great. Blood pressure is great. So now we kind of have this picture in our head of how they're doing physically and mentally. Let's go over and start looking at the questions. So this is the first of six. Um, which of the following findings requires immediate follow-up? And then we select all that apply. One of the nice things about this item is that it's actually a traditional item. Um, you've seen these items before on your tests in nursing school. And as we know, the questions that are inside of a case study can be any item type. They can be some of those newer ones, which are a little intimidating, or they can just be these traditional items that you're used to seeing. So that's kind of nice here, because this is an item that we've seen this before. So let's go through one by one. And, you know, we can see here this word immediate is bolded. So we're not talking about like, hey, yeah, we want to make sure that they're going to discharge with this information. We're focusing on what's going on right now. So let's pick out those cues here and see what we find. Select all that apply. So chest tightness, absolutely. That's something we want to follow up on right now. There's some scary things that are related to chest tightness. Flat affect, that's definitely a concern for like a mood disorder or there's some other neurological disorders that can cause that. But like, is that my primary focus? Maybe not. Heart palpitations, that's another cardiac. When we're thinking ABCs, that's way up there. Minimal eye contact, that also feels like a mental health issue that we definitely want to follow up on. But like right now, it's probably not our highest priority. Shortness of breath, absolutely. ABCs, this could be perfusion. This could be it could be because of a respiratory issue. A lot of reasons that this can be scary. Weight loss, this has been over the first, or I think it's in the last couple of weeks or some extended amount of time. So this is not our, our primary concern right now. So go ahead and hit submit. Now, because this is a case study, um, in our study product, you're not gonna see the answers right away because the answers are the answers to the question and the explanation, because that would just totally give away the next question. So we're gonna hold off on that and come back to it because we definitely wanna learn from what we've answered this question with here. So moving on to the next one. So item number two of six, and we're looking over here. It doesn't say that there's new exhibit information, and we can see over here that it's the same three as before. Sometimes we'll add a new time interval here to the nurse's notes or the vital signs. They haven't done it on this situation, and if they had done it, they would have told us over here. So we don't need to look at the notes again. We can just focus here on what the item looks like. So one of the newer NGN item types, this is a multiple response matrix item. So going into this question, we know that it's multiple response. So I could go ahead and I could click every single answer, trying to get as many points as I could, but they would knock off points for the incorrect answers. So we want to focus in and make sure we're only clicking the correct answers because they're going to subtract a point if we select the wrong ones. So looking at it, the best way to think about it really is column by column. So let's just focus. Here we're comparing hyperthyroidism myocardial infarction, heart attack, and then panic disorder. So let's go one by one, starting with hyperthyroidism. What are the findings that would be associated with that? You know, it says here they may support more than one disease process. So we know that diaphoresis, it doesn't just end up in one of these spots. It could be on all three of them. So diaphoresis, meaning sweating, definitely with hyperthyroidism, they have hot flashes, they have poor, um, so they have more sensitivity to heat and poor ability to, to cope with with the heat, like if they're outside in the summer or they're just in a situation that's giving them a lot of heat, they don't cope with that very well. Trembling hands, absolutely, that's related to hyperthyroidism because of the um, hormone imbalances. And then also heart palpitations here absolutely is related to one of the thyroid conditions. Sometimes I feel like I get hung up on hypo versus hyperthyroidism. Hyper here meaning a lot of extra. So they have hyper extra thyroid hormone. And when you have extra, you're more stimulated and you do have heart palpitations. So we want to click that one. And I believe shortness of breath is also that one I'm kind of I need to think about that some more. So let's move on to the next column, myocardial infarction. 
Diaphoresis is absolutely one of those subtle signs that people don't always realize, you know, a little bit of heartburn and some sweating. It feels like, eh, it's kind of random, but maybe not a big deal, but it's actually one of those subtle signs of a heart attack. So absolutely, we want to remember that one and recognize that that's one of the appropriate things to click here with myocardial infarction. Trembling hands, mm, it doesn't feel like particularly characteristic of MI. I'm gonna leave that one off. Heart palpitations, absolutely, this is a cardiac problem. They're gonna feel some, some flutters and some weird stuff going on. Shortness of breath, absolutely, there's a big issue here with perfusion when you're having an infarct in your heart. You're not getting that oxygen where it needs to be and so you're gonna become short of breath. And then thinking about shortness of breath here, absolutely that's related. You know, when you're having an infarct in your myocardial tissue, you're not getting perfusion to your heart. Your heart's not working like it's supposed to be. The blood's not moving forward as well as it's supposed to be. And so absolutely shortness of breath is something that you could see with that. And it's definitely one you want to follow up on. All right, and then panic disorder. So this is more a mental health issue. And so the physiological stuff going on is more related to how these hormones our body is releasing, like um, adrenaline, how it's affecting us. So it doesn't mean that, you know, shortness of breath, I would absolutely say is related. Does that mean we're having a respiratory problem? No, but we're having a situation where our body is saying like, oh, it's, it's time to panic, it's time to go, something needs to happen, we're short of breath because our body's getting ready to do something because we're feeling that anxiety of panic. Heart palpitations also definitely um, related to panic disorder. You know, with the flood of stress hormones you're having, a lot of people do report chest discomfort. So they'll have that feeling of like flip-flopping in their chest and that, you know, we call that heart palpitations. Um, also diaphoresis, again, similar related to the same thing. You're gonna see some sweating. So that would be related as well. Trembling. I think that's related. I mean, you're feeling really freaked out and people get trembly when that happens. Uh, okay, so then let me just double check what we're missing here. This one's empty. I think that's okay. And then hyperthyroidism, this one's empty. Um, I feel like they might be short of breath, especially because we know that with temperature dysregulation and they do have elevated temperature, Shortness of breath is sometimes this thing the body does to kind of compensate for that. So kind of releasing more air, breathing faster, breathing faster, they may feel like shorter breath. So I feel like we could click that one and see how we go. So let's go ahead and submit. And again, we won't see the explanation just yet. So we'll move on to the third question. A lot to think about with this. All right, item three out of six, and we can see here that something else has popped up. And then also it tells us right here, the nurse has reviewed the information from diagnostic results and laboratory results. So we wanna make sure we're checking out those tabs again. So coming over here, we've got laboratory results. And as we know, troponin is one of the hallmark labs that tells us whether or not somebody's having a heart attack. So here with troponin, it looks like they've tested two different types. I don't know exactly the difference, but I know that troponin is a test they do to tell me whether or not they're having an acute myocardial infarction situation. So I can see here, they do give me the reference ranges. So I know that a troponin value here of um, more than this is going to be concerning because the normal value is less than 0 0.1. So anything that's above that would be concerning. This person's value is 0, 0.0. So the normal being less than 0 0.1, we're in that safe range. We've got a normal value for this troponin. And then the same here, they're at zero, the normal is less than 0 0.03. So I feel like we're really ruling out here heart attack is the cause of this person's symptoms. So again, we're going through the clinical judgment measurement model, we've analyzed the cues, and now we're kind of prioritizing like what is going on and what do we do here? Um, and then we need to also make sure we look at the diagnostic results. So looking at diagnostic results here, the ECG is showing that they're in sinus tachycardia. We already knew they were in tachycardia. We looked at their vital signs and their heart rate was elevated. So, and this is not one of those findings like um, there are certain, you know, ST segment elevation and other arrhythmia findings that would tell the provider that there's a potential for heart attack here. And they're really the ones to look at that and, and make decisions most of the time. But here we know at least that this is something we already knew was going on and it's not one of those hallmark scary arrhythmias that make us think 
heart attack. So we've kind of ruled out heart attack, which is great. All right, moving over to look at item three here, it's asking us to complete the following sentence by choosing from the list of options. So the nurse recognizes that the client is at highest risk. So again, we have that bolded word and highest telling us that this is the most one we wanna focus on, it's a priority here. That doesn't mean that the other ones aren't potential answers, but we're, we're focusing on the most important here, which makes sense because this is the prioritizing hypotheses question in our clinical judgment measurement model. So highest risk for developing blank as evidenced by blank. So here, let's look at our options and see what we can pick from. So we think they're at highest risk of heart failure, agoraphobia, or thyroid storm. Here with this patient, I think from everything we've read in their history and physical especially, I feel like we're leaning towards a mental health issue with their affect, and then they're not reporting a lot of GI distress that people can have with um, thyroid issues, like especially you know bad hyperthyroidism. So I think we can kind of rule out the heart failure because we already know it's not cardiac. And I think we can go away from the thyroid issue right now. And I think we're gonna focus on the mental health condition. So here I would say the most related mental health condition here is agoraphobia. So I think that's gonna be our answer for what they're at highest risk for because they're having those panics in situations and it seems to be they're on a bus when it happens so maybe it's related to being around people so let's click that as our concern for like a complication or a future problem they may develop and then as evidenced by blank so let's see where our options are here uh fear of future attacks they absolutely have that we saw that and then evidenced by chest pain and palpitations well that's definitely related to panic attacks but if we're trying to support our answer of agoraphobia, that may not be the best. And then here, recent weight loss and loss of appetite. So again, with this type of question, our first blank has been answered. And so the second blank is needing to support what we've answered in the first blank. So we really need to focus on this wording as evidenced by blank. So really what tells us that agoraphobia is going to be the answer? And that I feel like is fear of future attacks because when you get around a group um, and you have that anxiety, I think is characteristic of agoraphobia. So I think we're gonna go ahead and click fear of future attacks because it seems most related. All right, and again, we'll come back for the explanation here. So moving on, we got question number four. So we're over halfway there and we're moving on in the measurement model to the stage of generating solutions now. And then we have this little alert here again that says the nurse has reviewed the information from nurse's notes. So we know they've added more information. There's not a new tab here, but if we scroll down on the nurse's notes, we can see there's a new time frame. So it was 8 a.m. and now it's 9 a.m. an hour later. Uh, we're evaluating the client. They look irritable, fidgety, restless, uh, still organized and logical thought process. Uh, Anxiety is six on a scale of zero to 10. And then we're giving them a benzo to help with anxiety. So this Alprazolam is one of the benzodiazepines. So that's gonna help with anxiety. So we're gonna go ahead and give them that medication here. And then other solutions we can provide. That's what we wanna focus on with this question is what else can we do to help this client right now? Um, so here we're gonna say for each potential intervention, click the intervention as indicated or contraindicated. So this is again a matrix item, but it's a multiple choice matrix, which means that there's one answer for every row. So they are telling us, give us one answer in every single row, which helps us understand that they're not gonna take away points if we click the wrong option, because they're telling us you need to put an answer at every row. So this is one of those where they give you points for every right answer, but they don't take away points because they've already said, we want five answers, so give us five answers, please. So just kind of think about that as we go through here. So one potential intervention is encouraging the use of positive self-talk. I think that's appropriate. This person, again, if they're having some mental health issues could benefit from that. I think a lot of people can benefit from that. So I would say that that's indicated. So we would click this column. And I think it's helpful to kind of treat each row as a separate question here. So then we're gonna go on to the next one and it says, ask the client about any recent life stressors. So is it good to bring it up right now? Is it therapeutic to talk about that? 
Mm, I think generally when we read about therapeutic communication, we want to help the client open up about this kind of thing. So I think it's probably indicated. We'll click that. Um, assist the client to recognize physical symptoms of anxiety. This is absolutely helpful because here we've given a benzodiazepine. If they walk away with a prescription for that medication, they're going to need to know when to take it. So having them understand like what is it that's like a, a precursor, a sign that this may be coming, a panic attack. Can we recognize those signs? So this is a really important. I think a great nursing driven intervention here is we want to make sure they can understand when this is, if this happens again. Um, encouraging the client to spend some time alone when feeling anxious. Oof, that one's tricky. Should they be alone when they're anxious? If they're if we're considering agoraphobia, that one's kind of difficult. Um, I don't think we want to do that. I think we want to encourage support systems is what we usually read about in our nursing textbooks. But then again, if they're going to be agoraphobic, I'm not sure about that one. I think... Being alone can be relaxed. Let's click indicated, not sure. And then reinforcing abdominal breathing exercises to use for anxiety, that's very much something that's appropriate for most people. Um, so this is a great situation to, to use that intervention, which I think is why it's an important option here, because this is something they can do when they're feeling that panic coming on and the medication maybe isn't available or they haven't taken it and they just, this is something they could sit down and do. And if we teach them this, then it can help them in the future. So I would say that's absolutely something we wanna do. So we answered all five rows, perfect. Move on to the next one. All right, item number five, six, we're getting close. Um, it says the nurse reviews information from nurses notes and vital signs. So we know we've got some more information to look at. Let's scroll down further on the nurse's notes. It says here, a couple hours later, the client rates, rates anxiety as two on a scale of zero to 10. That's great. So we've come down from a six to a two and they want to go home. They're ready to go home. The client is referred to an outpatient mental health clinic for follow-up. That's perfect. Cause it is the nurse's job absolutely to make sure that we're not just, hey, here's a band-aid. Now you can go home. This is a, we want to make sure that this chronic condition is going to be carried through with further treatment. So we want to make sure, hey, do you have the phone number for the clinic you need to go with? Do you have an appointment set up yet? This is something when you're discharging a patient, this is the nurse's job. You need to make sure that this is happening. So here we say the client is referred to the clinic. Perfect. We can check that box. And then our other new information that we got here was under the vital signs. So we can compare the 8 a.m. vitals to the 11 a.m. vitals and see that with the anxiety going down, things have really normalized here. The respirations have gone down. They're still satting really well. Everything else is getting much more normalized, which is great, which is another good indication that um, they are getting close to ready to discharge. All right, so looking at the item here, we're saying the nurse is reinforcing teaching about newly prescribed medications. So we've got alprazolam, which is again, that benzodiazepine, which helps acutely with anxiety. So you take that when you're really feeling the symptoms. And then sertraline, which is going to be a long-term medication that you take scheduled at the closest time possible every day to reach a steady state of that medication in your bloodstream. It's an SSRI. So it's an antidepressant. It's going to help with depression, anxiety. Um, so we've got two new medications. They're similar in drug in the category of treating mental health, similar in that way, but they're taken very differently. So we need to say here, which, or we need to read here, which of the following statements by the nurse are appropriate to include in the teaching? So what do we say to our patient here to make sure they understand? Select all that apply. Again, this is one of the older item types. So that's helpful because it's not one of the new or more intimidating ones. For option one here, it's saying, um, avoid driving after taking out Prazolam. That's a great thing to teach about. It is definitely a nursing intervention because it's very safety focused. If you take a benzodiazepine and then get behind the wheel, there's this risk of that sedative side effect causing an accident. They usually talk on the prescription bottle as well. They say, you know, don't drive or operate heavy machinery when you're taking this medication because it's dangerous. So this is something we want to drill in and make sure they understand that if you take this medication for your anxiety, it could make you sleepy and then it could be dangerous to, to drive a car. So we're going to click that one. 
Um, and then contact your healthcare provider immediately if you experience suicidal thoughts. This is very important. As we all know, when you first start taking an antidepressant, you can quickly get to this period of like, you know, kind of euphoric, you're feeling more energy, you're feeling better, which is great. But if you're still kind of depressed, this can lead you to have more energy to act on a potentially suicidal action. So here, and this is particularly relevant in the younger group of people, that's when they see it more. So this patient's 21. So this is something we absolutely want to make sure it gets across is that you're taking a new SSRI. There's this potential for this, you know, very devastating complication here. So we want to drive home that, hey, if you're starting to have those suicidal thoughts when you're, which happens kind of that initiation period of taking the medication, contact your healthcare provider because that's not normal. It's not a long-term side effect of the medication. So they really need to know that right now to look out for that. So we definitely want to cover that with this patient. Um, do not abruptly stop taking alprazolam because you may experience withdrawal. Mm, that one is true. That one I'm less confident on. Let's click it. Um, limit alcoholic beverages to no more than one drink a day while taking alprazolam. That one's a little tricky because I think they're not supposed to drink at all when they take alprazolam. But limiting is good if it's a concern because both alcohol and this benzodiazepine are going to be sedating, which is why we're concerned about it. I'm not going to click it because I'm wondering if they shouldn't have any. So instead of one, it should be none. So I'll leave that one off for now, but I'm kind of hung up on it. We'll see. And then option number five, take sertraline at the onset of a panic attack. That's that's wrong. We know that SSRIs, like I said, they need to be taken at the same time every single day because they help prevent. Um, so taking this, you may be taking too much of it, which can cause complications if you're taking it right at the onset of a panic attack. So that's incorrect teaching for this. Um, so we're definitely going to leave that one off because I, I feel pretty confident that's wrong. So looking back, we've got three selected. This is a multiple response, it doesn't tell us how many to click, which means that if we get an option wrong, they're gonna count off a point. So I really wanna be careful here. Limit alcoholic beverages. Since I'm on the fence, I'm not gonna click it because I don't wanna lose a point. All right, submit. All right, moving on to the last question here in our case study. It doesn't say we've gotten any new information. I don't see any new tabs over there. So I think we're looking at a future time interval. So the client returns to the mental health clinic for a one month follow-up visit, which is great because I love it when we can also see like, what is this looking like long-term? Which client statement would indicate that the client requires additional therapy to cope with panic disorder? So this is a single best question. So there's only one right answer, which is really helpful. Um, let's read here. I realize that my panic attacks um, are under control. I'll eventually need to be tapered off. I purchased a watch that alerts me when my heart or respiratory rate increases so I can begin breathing exercises. That sounds like good. I, I'd say they don't need additional therapy if they're doing this. That sounds like something they should be doing. Probably helpful. Um, my support group has been helping to identify when my thoughts are not realistic so I can talk myself out of feeling the panic. That's really helpful. I mean, having someone else help you realize when you're spiraling is great. So I don't think that needs additional therapy. I think that's great. I think maybe they're doing well. Um, taking the bus has been a trigger for me so my boss is letting me work from home. Well, that may not be their ideal. You know, we don't want them to necessarily have to sequester themselves at home because of their medical condition. So that may mean that there's opportunity for them to progress more. I mean, it's great that their boss is being flexible, but is that what they want long-term? Taking the bus. This is kind of one to, to mull over a little bit, trigger for me. Yeah, they're having to request accommodations from their job because their mental health condition is holding them back. So I would say that this is something that maybe they could progress with. So I think, I think that's the right answer. We'll go with that. So we'll submit, and then we can finally see the explanations, which is great. Let's go ahead and move backwards, though, because this is item six of six, and we want to see all the explanations. Uh, for you world, we have them, of course, for every single question. So we can go back a little bit and see. Um, here's the explanation for this. So we'll talk through why every single option is right and wrong. 
Um, we got scored three out of three. That's great because this is one of those where we could have gotten points knocked off and we didn't, which is awesome. If you want to know more, you can click this little thing, scoring rule. There's a little infographic about how that works. We did great for this one. Um, for our multiple response matrix, I think we got them all right. Um, and this is another one where you could have gotten points knocked off. So there's that same scoring rule information there. And it tells us 11 out of 11, we got the max points, which is great. Item number three, again, both right. This is a zero one, which means that because they told us we had to have two responses, they weren't going to take away points, but we got both points, which is great. Uh, another matrix. Okay, this one I think we hovered over for a bit. Um, do it is, let's see. So this was wrong. So the correct answer was contraindicated. Okay, so they're not supposed to be alone when they're feeling anxious. They're supposed to reach out for a support system. So, but they told us we had to have one option for every one answer for every row. So they're not going to take away points, which means that we got four out of five. So one, two, three, four, and they didn't subtract a point, even though we got that one wrong. So four out of five, that's great. And then number five here, another SATA, we got three out of three, which is great. So overall, we did pretty, pretty good for this case study. And then when you are studying and taking your time, obviously we want to highly encourage you to go through and read, even if you got the answer right why, like understanding the why behind the correct and the incorrect options is really that learning opportunity here. So as you work through these, I would definitely encourage you to start again from item number one and read your explanations because that's where the, the learning is really going to be reinforced. And that's it for this case study. Whether you're taking the current NCLEX or the next generation NCLEX coming on April 1st, 2023, practicing NGN questions will help you prepare for the exam and bedside practice. Visit nursing.uroll.com for more information and to see our options for RN and PN and to start practicing today.